I knew how to treat her right. I took her down a road and I showed her the lights of Ammonport. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just, you know, wasn't it? It was a great evening, wasn't it? <laughs> but I had an expectation, yeah. which developed into anticipation. Yeah. Where is all this going to lead to? Yeah. On the other hand, you know, She went with it. <laughs> but that's how it was. But then after that, of course, then came the phone call. She was in Edinburgh. I was living uh, down in South Wales. And uh, it was like, you know, go up to the old, remember the old coins in the box, A and B? And they stack the two fences, you know? And I go up there, get to the phone box, and somebody had taken the money out and wrecked it or something like that. Then I had to walk a mile back past the house down to the neck of the village below us and pray that they, but then suddenly found out too, they were very good, whoever did it left the phone so that anybody could ring for free <laughs> and I said thank you Lord <laughs> a miracle but there is something about that expectation I walked through rain and snow and, and they didn't bother me, I just went because I was going to talk to my dear my wife to be. <laughs> and uh, as the, it, you know, and I think there's something about that. If you love the Lord, yeah. make it real. Don't say you love the Lord because everybody else. You know, that's the one thing about, it, about it, with Christians is, you know, that we say, oh, well, they say it, so therefore I say it. Be real with God. Just be real. Say it as it is. And just have that relationship. But I, I want to encourage you this morning. To have a heart of expectation. Yes. That we'll be, we'll, that when we come to the house of the Lord, we come with an expectation mm -hmm. that results in an anticipation of what God can do. We yeah. prayed about the greatness of God and, 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 and the fact that we, we serve a mighty God. Amen? Yeah. And uh, there's that song that goes, What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Worship and adore Him. Yeah, but what a mighty God I serve. Amen. You serve. Amen. 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 And I just want to encourage you with that. That it's time, it's time to move on. There's a moving on that's coming into the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe it's exactly everywhere. That in the body of Christ, there's a moving on. There's something, there's an anticipation in my spirit. Oh, yeah. That God is going to take us on. Yeah. I thank God for what he's doing amongst us and I praise God and, and uh, the ministry that we've had here in the church over the last year is building us up if you take it, if you listen to it you, know, you can listen to it on YouTube uh, Paul, Pastor Paul's ministry you know, it's just building you up why? because God is get, wanting us to be strong wanting us to have the strength to take us on to the next you know, Israel went into, into the promised land line upon line Precept upon precept. Yeah. They didn't say, oh, I'm going to go in again. Oh, one line. Conquer this one. Conquer that one. Get to take dominion over that area. And such like that. And uh, it was, um, was Caleb, wasn't it? Who said, give me this mountain. That's my inheritance there. And as some of us, you're forgetting that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And as, a, as an heir, we have a right to... To that which God has reserved for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll start my message in about a minute now. But, <laughs> but, I, but I, I really believe it. I just please, please come with an expectation. You might have had a rotten week. You might have had a tough week. Perhaps there's something that came your way. But there's something in my spirit that says, I, well, like David, we can say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yeah. And it wasn't that because, you know, he was a warrior king. He was always a man in battle. He always wore armor. He had his sword with him constantly. But when he came to the house of the Lord, he had to lay it all aside. Well, that was the battles in the week gone by. But now... I'm encouraged to go to the house of the Lord. I'm going to go with an expectation. And David wrote beautiful poetry in the Psalms, worshipping God, magnifying the Lord. Amen? 
And so we can also do that because we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's our right. It's our right. Yeah. Why don't you claim what is your right? Yeah. You know? Claim it. Not in the sense of just, you know, there's a term that used to happen years ago, you know, what is it? Blab it and grab it. Totally, totally wrong, 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 wrong. But where there is a people that are have a, a, a right relationship, a living relationship with the living God, I tell you what, you'll see things, things that you've been praying for, things that you've been longing for with your children, with your, with your, part, with your wife or husband or whatever relationship there is, and you're saying, God, I really need you to, in, to intervene in that. I tell you what, when you get the relationship right, you'll start to see things. We, I tell you what, Margaret and I, with our own children, we've seen God do amazing things. But it's down to my relationship with him. Yeah. He's not a God that we pull out of the drawer and say, oh, there you are. Come on and out you come. Right. Come on, do this for me. Totally wrong. It's that old having a, a true expectation. Oh, I met with the Lord this morning. I met in his word. I met him in prayer. And it's not about the amount of scriptures you read. It's not about the length of your prayer. It's about the heart that is right before God. And that relationship. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know, the, you know I, I've said it before, uh, that sometimes, you know, I can read one verse of scripture that morning, in a particular morning. I can read one scripture, one verse, and it just blows me away. And I live on it all day, and I meditate upon it, and I think, wow, Lord, that is terrific. You've shown me something about yourself. But then sometimes I can read a whole chapter. And then perhaps other times I might read the whole book. Not the big ones, mind, because, you know, I'd still be reading them. <laughs> but no. And it's that relationship in prayer. Make your prayer genuine. You don't, you know, we, I think it's because of, of being churchified, as I call it. It's like, you know. No, I won't say. But. There is this whole thing of, of that relationship. I want to encourage you with that. I, and I'd love you to prove me wrong. Come to me and say, didn't work for me. Tell you what, our God is real. Our God is real. Amen? Right then, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, what shall I do, Lord? Right, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I want to... Well, I'll read the scripture first. Um, oh, we're right up in time. Great. Pastor Paul's not here, you know. God bless you, Pastor. Um, <laughs> but I want to read a scripture from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And this is, I'm sure, well known to you. And it says there, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith, their faith, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? It, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked out through the, st through the stand onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Wouldn't it be great if we, were a, if we were became a church 
where people outside would say, what's going on in there? <laughs> and then when they come in, they, they sit around and, and then they, they would sort of say, well, I've never seen anything like this before. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be awesome? Going back to the days when we lived in my steak and, and uh, when I moved to my steak, Margaret and I and the family, it was already happening, but there was a revival going on in the church. The church that started out was four ladies in the church. Then Pastor John Marshall moved down from, from London, came to the church, four ladies. And then God, then there was a ministry that came uh, from, from uh, Stoke-on-Trent way. Um, Pastor Ron Powell, um, a Yorkshire man, and he came and he preached and he left something of God in the church. The next thing you know, there's a, re a revival going on. In a room that was, bring these walls in a little bit more, okay? And uh, rows of seats going up, what I would say probably five seats wide that side. Oh no, a bit more than that, uh, six, uh, the beach, uh, six seats side anyway. And God began to move and the place became packed. People came in, people from the, from the outside, and it was amazing. A, a year after that was going on, Margaret and I came over and moved to the church there and became part of the leadership there. And God continued to move and we saw great and tremendous things. We, we, it, it got so full, we got rid of the aisle. And we had to ask the youth to go out the back. And we had to say, look, and they were upset because we, they couldn't see anything now. They were, but people were coming in and, on a, and in the summertime, there's a concrete apron at the front of the church, a small concrete apron, a uh, fl uh, floor area. And people would stand there with the doors open wide and watching and listening. And God was moving sovereignly. And there were three guys there, uh, where there were four starting off with them, four Peter Yeoman went to Oakhampton. But there was, my, there was uh, John Marshall, David Waters, and myself, and Peter, as I said, who was there, moved to Oakhampton. But God began to move. And the wonderful thing about it is this, that we, if, to be honest with you, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. I'll be honest with you. We, did, we, we didn't know what God would do. We just, it just happened around us. And there'd be amazing things. And we take it in turns you know, to, to lead the meeting, in, in, you know, and uh, we, I think we, we took a Monday off, but then there were meetings, and that, and, and that went on, but, but it was wonderful, the place was packed out, we saw people get delivered, we saw people getting healed, we saw people getting saved, and that was the birth of the church in my stay, in, in, for those of you who remember the days of Bethel, uh, yeah, New Life Christian Centre, sorry, but what I want to say to you is this, there was an expectation with these four guys, three guys. There was an expectation. We didn't have a clue, but there was an expectation. Why? Because God was there. The Lord himself was ministering. Yeah. And when I think, he, and, and John would come to us before the start of every meeting, and he'd say, right, he said, who's got a word for tonight? And he'd look at us and look around, and if we had a word, we would say, yeah, I think I got, I got a word for tonight. Uh, right, okay, you're speaking. Right, who's going to lead then? Who's going to lead? Uh, oh, um, yeah, you lead, something like that, you know. And we take it, what I'm saying is, we take it in turns, but to be honest with you, we didn't have a clue what was going to happen. And God had three men who didn't have a clue what we were doing. But the sovereign one was in the midst. Yeah. And we saw out from it, you know, from that, we, we took on a derelict cinema, converted it into what. Uh, what it, what it became a church, a house, and then we saw God really move, but in a more manageable way, and in a way, because I tell you, it, it is true that in revival, you can get tired and doing a job as well, you know, employment. But what I'm saying to you is this, about this whole thing of expectation. You see, these four men that came to talk, to, to, to get to Jesus, they came with an expectation. They didn't carry or drag this man on, the, it says a mat, so you could say, well, was it a mat like we have in the house? Or, or was it a bed? I don't know. But they came with an expectation. And they were not disappointed. They were not disappointed. And there's something about the, the connection between an expectation, an anticipation, 
and God moving. And we need to take responsibility for it. There's a whole world of people living next door to us and not a state that surrounds us. Never mind about the old county of Bridgend. Let's talk about what, we, what, we are, what is close to us. And let's pray that God would move in that community, in the Morva district. And however big it is and however many people there, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you have any ideas, Vern, on the population of Morva. It's got to be in excess of 2,000. Easily, easily. And we want people to come here and, we've only, and we can about get 100 chairs in here. Let's get real, church. But we want to see God move because they are going to a lost eternity. They're going to hell. While we are enjoying heaven here on earth. Is that sometimes how, how, we, how we, we, we portray ourselves? But I believe that where there is a bunch of people, you see, when I look at the congregation of the churches that, I, that uh, uh, I visit, I look at the congregation, and the first word that comes into my mind is potential. Whether it's a church of hundreds or thousands, uh, you know, not many, but I've been in churches with a, a few hundred there, and I look and I say, great. They're in a city. They're a few hundred. And I think to myself, well, you're in a city, and the city size might be something like, you know, a few hundred thousand people. And I think, well, you're not that big then, if you're 500. But do you understand what I'm saying? That there is, a, that God is looking, and I look at the potential that is within a, in a church fellowship, and I say, this, this church could be bigger. But we've got to come to that point of coming into his presence with an expectation that they might say of us when we walk out, I see that you have been with Jesus. Just by their very walk. Just by their talk. And I just want to encourage you to do that because, like David the psalmist, he says, my expectation is of the Lord. Not of the pastor at the front. He's a lovely man. He's a great man. He's got a lovely wife and children. He's, he's got all good. He's a tremendous uh, you know, teacher of the word. But we need to understand it's not about the man at the front. It's about the man in the midst. The man Christ Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do that because God wants to prove himself to us. We sing, you know, what's a mighty God we serve. Well, is he? Or do I just say it and, you know, tell everybody else? It's a catchy song. It's a lovely tune. But God wants us to know the reality of his presence. And as I was reading the, this account given to us in, in, in Mark 2, that it, it says there that, that, that it says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, verse 1, several days later, the news spread quickly. The news spread quickly that he was back home. Morning. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. It makes me think, you know, I'm saying Jesus came back and the house was filled. And this is something, this is the key to what I really want to get at. That if we come with an expectation that Jesus is here, the house will be filled. Yeah. Not because of anyone here in particular, but there's a bunch of people that want the presence of God, that have an expectation of the presence of God, that will seek the face of God, not leave it to the pastor or to, or to the ministry team or, or whatever else, but will pick up the responsibility. You know, it's like I, I have, I've come to the conclusion that if you, if you are saved more than five years, for more than five years, then you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it comes with responsibility as a disciple. What is that responsibility? Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what's on your shoulders and my shoulders. 
to seek the, the kingdom of God, to seek to know his will, to seek to, to say, Lord, what do you want to do in, in the Morva district? Well, Lord, what do you want to do? Well, we know that he wants to save. But he wants to transform it. He wants to transform our nation. Tra transform it. There's, a, there's, a, there's um, uh, an organization called Barna uh, out in America, and they do a lot of surveys. And, and if you want to know who's doing what and how much and how many, that's the place to go. And they came out to this state, and I read this on, on the internet, and they said that it will take 10% of a community to be saved to change it. So if we're in 2,000, if we say we've got 2,000 in the community across the road from us here, it'll only take 10, if 10% 10 of those can be saved, we'll see it changed. It's not much really, is it? It's not much. What's that? 200, thank you. 200 people. That's all it takes, 200. It's like holding double services here. Think of it like that, because there's only 100 seats we, we've got. But what I'm saying is that in, then I understand, and then, then, I, uh, then after that, of course, it will grow on its, you know, if the teachings are right, etc., according to the Word of God, that, that that will then grow. But the atmosphere will change. And that's what the Barna uh, people found out. And, it, and, and I thought it was an interesting reading that. And so we see that, that this is, whose house is this? Whose house is this? Whose is it? God's house. It's his house. And I know that if I come to your house, that there are rules and regulations in your house. I don't want you going to my cupboards and prying out and opening the drawers and and just have to look around. Unless you have my permission. I, don't, I wouldn't expect to come to your house and say, oh yeah, what has Eddie got in there then? Oh, let's have a look now then. And Eddie's looking at me with his jaw dropping, you know. All his tr treasures are revealed. His fishing rod, his hooks. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, it's his house. And it's his terms and conditions that we are called to be a people of holiness, a people who live in righteousness. You know, what, you know that's a, those are big words that we think, oh, they're old-fashioned words. We don't use words like that. But let me tell you what they mean. Holiness is wholesomeness. What you and I allow into our homes, the challenge I want to bring to you is this. Is it what you have in your house wholesome? The other one is that there's holiness and there's also righteousness. Righteousness, that's an old word. But all it means is doing that which is right. That's all it is. It's very easy. Nothing complicated about it at all. Nothing sanctimonious about it at all. But that is what, it's God's house and that's what he wants in his house. A people that are wholesome. A people that do that which is right according to his word. Yeah. There's no more than that. Don't complicate it. You don't need a big thick book on theology to understand it. It's very, very simple. And I believe that God, because then the, what happens is that when the presence of the Lord comes, we'll see that there's a change in our nature. Because, hey, we are temples of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. He lives in us. He lives in us and God wants to change us. We are changed, he says, from glory to glory. I, you know, there's been a change in my life since the day I gave my heart to the Lord. I've got to be honest with you. That when I, was, when I got saved at the age of 12, I was okay. Then the teenage came. And then there were four guys that used to hang out together. One of them had a car. So that was it. We were off. But then it came a change of conviction in my life. And I realized that some of the stuff that we were doing wasn't good, wasn't right. God didn't require it.
But then as I came to understand that Christ dwells in me, that this is his house, and I had to understand what holiness was, that in my own life, you know, and it's not being holier than thou. This is how it is, living the Christian life. He changes us. He transforms us. The Holy Spirit's work is to develop Christ in us, that Christ-like nature, so that others might say to us, you have been with Jesus. It's a living relationship. It's a living relationship. It's not coming to church and getting a book stamped. It's not about giving the tithes and offerings. No, it's not that at all. It's doing that which he requires because this is his house. And no matter what you or I think, it is according to his word. And so God, by the Holy Spirit, I believe God wants to do great things here, but we've got to get it right in the sense of not say, I'm right, you're right, no, Am I right in his sight? The God, the man, we look on the outward, but where does he look? He looks at the heart, he looks at the inside. And people observe us, and people, you know, it's like in the street where we live. We've seen God do great things in our street. We've been praying for our neighbors that they should come to Christ. And we do know the atmosphere is changing in our street. It's great. And we, we're praying and, we, and they're asking us the right questions when you get into conversation with them. I was in the house three, three weeks ago. My friend Peter, on his own, single man, buried his wife about two or three years ago. We were in conversation. I was helping him with the computer because his eyesight was going. And he said, can you do something? For my I said, yeah, I'll have a go. He said, I'll have a go. He told so, did what I could. Oh, great, he said. And then he came out of, out of the blue. He said, do you know what I like? He said, I like those black preachers. Oh, when they, I'm going, you like black preachers? And I had just come back from America where we had listened to a black preacher. And, you know, you know he held the, mic, held the microphone up and he go, is there anybody out there? <laughs> but I've got to be honest with you. I, it, it, he blessed the socks off us because there came a point and then God began to move in the meeting. But this man, our neighbor, said, oh, I like all that. I said, you do? Yeah, he said, what kind of church do you go to? Nothing like that. Yeah, there's so many. And he went on to explain his views on church and that. But there was something then, as we were going on, he stops and he says to me, he said, what's this born again stuff, he said? Oh, I said, you want to know about being born again? Ah. Our conversation changed. And I was able for, for no more than three or four minutes explain to him what it means to be born again. I planted the seed. And he, I'm going out to the passage. As I was going out, he turns to me and he says, he said, actually, he said, this could become the house of God, couldn't it? He's looking around his house. I said, absolutely. It's the presence of God. So when I, when I see these things, I, I think to myself, God, you're doing something. You're answering prayer. Because we've been praying for our neighbors. We've only got 30 houses on the estate. But God is, so, is moving. I, we sense it when we go out in the street and they come and talk to us. The conversation is changing. And I just pray, Lord, give me your wisdom out to answer and out to speak to them. But what I'm saying is this, that just like these four men, they brought that man to Jesus. I'm going to ask you, who are you bringing to Jesus? Who have you got your ta eyes targeted on? You might be complaining about, you know, we lived on an estate. When we moved from London, we had to move out of London and come back to Wales. We went down this is we were applied for a house in one of the housing societies. And uh, the first one they showed us, oh, it was really nice. Nice location, lovely views. Oh, that'll do, fab. Thank you very much. When we kids the move, they said, sorry, you can't go into that house. We've got one on this estate. When we went there, well, what with drugs going on, 
And then one morning we got up and there's police lying down with guns pointing at one particular house. I said, oh, nice, this is, this is nice. But it turned out to be one of the loveliest places. To, we had great neighbours. The guy across the road, you wouldn't talk to him, but his wife was lovely, she was great. Margaret became friends with her and she came to the house once or twice. And a and and neighbour next door, you led him to the Lord, didn't you? No. We spoke about the Lord. But what I'm saying is this, it doesn't matter where God has put you. I want to challenge you this morning. Is there something attractive about you that will draw, that, through, that Christ in you will draw them to you? You don't have to go to Africa, unless God tells you to go to Africa. But the truth of the matter is, our mission field is right outside our door. But we bring them to a living God. Not an idol. Not an idol who has eyes but doesn't see, or a mouth that doesn't speak, or ears that doesn't don't hear. We are bringing them to, to God through Jesus Christ. God our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ. That they might know him. Whom to know is what? Life eternal. Because that's what it's all about. Where will they spend eternity? Who takes responsibility for it? The church is everywhere. But we've got, we're looking over here. We're looking at that one. Oh, look how they do church. Oh, let's go over there. Oh, let's go this one. Let's go that one. All I want to know is what does God want to do here? What does God want to do in Penn Cove, where, I, where we live? We seek and pray and, and seek the presence of God. And I want to challenge you, because I tell you what, the potential in this room this morning is terrific. It's tremendous. And you say, oh, well, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not good at talking to people. Don't worry about it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. But you, to understand him, like some said, oh, I don't hear God, I can't hear God. Well, just be still. What does he say? Be still and know that I am God. That doesn't mean to say back off or pull yourself away. It means just have a spirit that is open to God and say, Lord, here I am. I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best communicator. I'm not the best, but Lord, help me to show your love that people may ask of you. Why? My neighbor across the road, I was doing, uh, my neighbor right across the fence from us, a lady as a son, there's no father there. Lovely, lovely lady and, and a lovely son she has. And... I, she sa I said to her, do you want me to come in and jet wash your garden walls, your small garden walls, and etc. And she said, oh, I'd love to have that, she said, because they were a bit grimy, you know. And I, I went and I did it. So I said, I'll tell you what, if you leave the back gate open, I said, I'll go in while you're in work and I'll do it. So that's what I did. I went in. Who's, I'm doing it like this. I turn around. And there's the neighbor across the road, one of the neighbors across the road, standing on the wall, looking in, in at me, doing that. And he said, oh, is that what you get up to? I said, yeah, I said, I'm just doing it as a favor to help the neighbor. And he said, he said to me, he said, why do, you, why do you do that then? Well, because I can do it. I'm able to do it. You see, sometimes in our Christian life, we... You know, God asks us to do things, and he doesn't ask you to do things he knows you can't do. Now, not everybody can... If I say to you, if I say to you go to your neighbor and jet wash their walls, you say, well, I can't do that. I'm not physically able, I don't... That's not the point. It's what, it's what you can do. I have a term now that I'm older. I'm not so athletic as I used to be. Was I ever athletic? I'm not quite sure. But if I can't do it, I'll tell you. And if I can do it, I'll do it. But don't get offended if I say, oh, sorry, I can't do it. I'm not able, don't have the whatever. But this is something, but it speaks to, to them. Oh, and this chap that was on the wall looking over. And he said, why do you do it? And I said, because I can. 
And at that time, we were, we were going to move away. We had found a place in, in near Swansea. We were going to move. And he said, well what, well, what happens then when you leave? Who's going to do it then? And I said, well, I've shown you how to do it. You can do it. <laughs> but it's this whole thing, you see, of making ourselves available. And, and, and get away from that, that old burden. Oh, the, oh, talk to my neighbors. Oh, oh. No, no. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's us that make a meal of it. Just rest in him. Just rest in him. Trust him. It might even, you know, Margaret will make cake or soup or something like that. Partly, you know, when I say she makes the soup, I cut the veg. And we make more than we require. So what do we do? We give it to our dear friend up the road. And I go up with a, with a container of soup. Oh, thank you for the soup, lovely. And he hands me the other one back. So he's got faith anyway. He's believing more. But what I'm coming to is this. Release the Christ in you. Release the Christ in you. Release the love for a neighbor. Release the love of God. Let, it be, let your life be an expression of his love. In kindness. If you, as I say, do it. If you can do it, do it. If you can't, well, you can't. There's no guilt about it. But there is a difference to say, I'm not going to do it. Or I don't want to do it. We are his people. His children. And I just, I just feel this morning that I've come away totally from the message, but we've got to come to that place, you know. You know, sometimes... It w <laughs> yeah, I've got time. I'm going to share this with you, the four men that came. This is a tremendous story in that uh, tremendous account, in that there's no names mentioned. The only name mentioned is Jesus. There's no names mentioned. And I was thinking about this story that, that I could turn it into a parable, because Jesus has spoken parables, you know. And what is it? An, an earthly account with a heavenly meaning. And I thought... Well, we've got an account, and, uh, and all that took place. It's, 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 that is, that's true what happened. But I thought to myself, well, who are these four guys? That they wanted to get this man to Jesus. Who was this man? How did he end up being paralyzed? And when you think about it, you know, I was thinking about it, and I said, who are these, who are these guys? And this... Who are these guys, the four that, that bore the man to Jesus? And so I decided to turn it into a parable. So these four men now, they come to the house and it says they couldn't get in because of the crowd. Jesus was in the house. They were on the outside. They couldn't even get through the front door. But they were determined because they had an expectation and an anticipation that this man was going to get healed. So, someone in the crowd turned to, to, to them and said, why do you think Jesus is going to heal this man that you've brought in? What, what, why do you think, what makes you think he's going to heal you? So the first man says, as he was holding the corner of that mat, he said, well, actually, he said, I was a leper and Jesus healed me. And uh, you can read my account, he said, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3. He was healed of his leprosy. So he had authority to speak. It wasn't a lie. It was truth. He had been healed. They go on to, on to man number two then, and said, and, and what makes you think that Jesus can heal this man then? Well, he said, I was blind. 
But now I can see. Mark 10 and verse 52. And then he said, they go on to the third man. And they said to him, well, what makes you think that Jesus can heal? Well, he said, I'm the man with the withered hand, he said. My hand was all crooked, he said. But then Jesus came and touched me. And he said, look at it now, he said. I've got full use. It's recorded in Luke chapter 6, verse 10. But then they come to the fourth man. And they say to him, well, what makes you think that Jesus can heal? Well, he said, my name is Lazarus. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. I want to tell you, each and every one of you, you've each got a testimony of the power of God in your life. I've got a testimony. And that's all God wants to share is that that testimony is not a copy of somebody else or that we try and make it bigger than what it is. It is what it is, and you're saved by grace. You've been renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a change in your life. You've been born again of the Spirit of God, and, and, and now you live for Christ. All you've got to tell them is that story. It's as simple as that. And that's what these men did. It said, we're getting through. We've proved it. We know Jesus works. We know he's real. It's strange, as you know, I, back in 2019, they had bowel cancer diagnosed. They came and took it away, cut it out, etc. It's strange in the Christian world, isn't it? You know, when you, when you share, oh, what's that? Oh, I heard you've been unwell. Oh, is that right? And it was strange, the different kind of people you meet in church. There are some who will be very encouraging, and they say, oh, we're praying for you, like here, at home, in, the, in this, our home church. People have been very good and been praying for us. And then I've been to other people, and they say, oh, I'm awful sorry you got that. Oh, I hope it doesn't do this. Oh, I hope you're all right. How long have they given you? You know? And there's about as much faith. There's more faith in a box of snap, crackle, and pop. You know, it's so, it's, it really is. And I, now I say, oh, I'm staying away from them. I have. I said, no, I don't want to talk to them. I want to talk to those who say they're praying for me and believe in God is going to touch me. Is that right, Gina? Yes. Gloria, sorry. Let the words of our mouths confess what we firmly believe. The Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we need to beware of our conversation. We need to beware how we speak about him who has saved us and redeemed us. We speak as, as we know him. I tell you what, uh, when I speak to those people that are, that are they're there with you, they're standing with you, I get encouragement, I feel better in myself, the Lord is good, the Lord is, is, is at work, I thank the Lord that I'm here today, I thank the Lord that it's now four years, have gone by almost four years since the whole thing started, and I thank the Lord. And what I realize is this, that if I'm alive today, I'm alive. And I just thank the Lord. And I, I just, I, I, honestly, I do. I thank the Lord. And, and there have been, oh, I could, I could give you what the Lord has been doing with the hospital and the doctors and consultants and all that. But God shows up in that little box room when we talk to the consultant. It's amazing. Margaret and I, I go, oh, all of a sudden, they, they say either a lady or a gentleman will come and talk to us, doctor. And then uh, just as we talk, all of a sudden, we feel, and I said to Margaret, I said, God's just showed up. And whatever they tell me, I know he's present there. And that gives me peace. 
It gives me that confidence. God, you've got this. David the psalmist said, Lord, teach me to number my days that I might apply my heart to wisdom. I tell you what, that verse has become more, even more poignant to me now. But through it all, what's that song, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. It's a good song. Through it all. I want to, you know, if I've upset you this morning, praise the Lord. <laughs> The trouble is, you see, when you get to my age, well, you know any of that, of course. <laughs> but when you get to my age, you reach a point where you say, I don't care. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> but there is this, this whole thing of, of really, I, that I might know him. That I might know him. And the power of his resurrection. That I might know him not somebody else's experience or somebody else's testimony. I want my own testimony of Jesus. And he's given me that. And all I got to do is when somebody asks me, I can say, well, actually, this is what happened to me. When our friend up the road asked me about being born again, I said, well, I, I was born again when I was 12. I thank God for his goodness. God is so faithful. But this is, we are called to share our testimony. Let's be, you know, we are to be a people of the word. Now we think of that as, oh, we've, we've got the Bible, black Bible. Oh, I've got a black Bible. Oh, I'm a, I'm a person of the Word, brother. This is it, the Word of God. But I realize in, in, my, in, in my life, during the whole of my life, and my journey with God, there have been times when this has been on the shelf, intact. Oh, I'll open it when I come to church, of course. Got to do that, you know, preacher's there. But let this word live in us. Let, let us have that relationship with the Lord that we can say, and others will say of us, you have been with Jesus. That when people come, it happened in Azusa Street, that the, the presence of God was so real in that building that there were people falling on their knees on the pavement us calling on God for salvation. Oh, do you believe it could happen here? I believe so. Margaret and I, we pray most days together, well, pretty much every day together. And we started praying, Lord, let there come a time when our neighbors will knock on our door and say, what must I do to be saved? I want the presence of God in my home. I don't want any uncleanness in my home. TV is still getting so bad now, just, just leave it there. Just get into that state. Can't watch anything, you know. Sometimes you watch, an old, you think, oh, watch an old program, the, the storyline sounds okay. And then when you get through it, you find, oh my gosh, forget it, turn it off. You know that song that goes, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather be his. This is still Steve. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than riches and gold. And that's it. Because what do we leave the generation that follows us? What do we leave our children with? What 
What flavor of Christ have we left? And what aroma of Christ have we left in the street where we live? In the workplace that we have found ourselves? What aroma of Christ do we leave there? I ask you, seek God, pray, and just believe God, because God is wanting to move by his spirit through the body of Christ like we've never seen before. And all God is looking for are a bunch of people that will say, I will do it your way. And we can't sing that song by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Because there's a lot of Christians that, that's all they say, I did it my way. Yeah, you did, and look what it's got you. But we want to do it his way. For unto him shall the glory be. Not unto man, not unto any flesh, not unto anything. It's all to him. All to Jesus. All to him. And I tell you what, when that, re that grips us, I tell you we start to see things move. We start to see God doing great things. But remember, it will never be of the flesh. It can never be. But trust God. Trust the Holy Spirit. If you say, Lord, I'm not strong enough for it, I'm, I'm, don't. whatever it is you may say, you're not, you can't do it for a very reason. You bring it to God and say, Lord, I can't do it. Can you, can you help me? And that's what the Holy Spirit comes in and helps us. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're going to have a cup of tea. Fellowship. You, you're restricted to one cup because two cups and you get drunk. So just... Uh, <laughs> but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I want to thank you for the fellowship and great... And uh, I just know God is up to something good, Brenda.